Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our text today uh, from that uh, timely epistle, Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, these words, you are called to freedom, but those will be our words for our text. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, dear fellow Americans, and our friends from Canada, let me be clear. I do not want to be president of the United States. (laughs) But if I were, if I were, I would govern on three general principles. Of course, biblical principles. Number one, number one, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Words have power. When you walk into this sanctuary, um, it's hard to not just walk in and the beauty, the majesty is just inescapable. When you look up at this altar, you see all kinds of stuff angels and martyrs and prophets and apostles and kings and priests, and the list goes on and on. But what is it that stands out? What I think is supposed to stand out amid all of the iconography, the beauty, the pictures, the people, are the words right there, smack dab in the middle of it all. In fact, it's the only place in this entire chancel you'll actually find words. And there it is, 24 karat gold. Gloria Patria te Filio et de Spirito Santo. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Those words have power. Etched right there. And it got me to thinking, What other words are most famously inscribed? Like the Declaration of Independence. The first three words are most significant in the Declaration, right? This is, um, stands out above all the rest. Not in terms of just sheer size, because they're big words, but in purpose. Our freedom represents we the people. That is vital to our freedom, and it mustn't be forgotten. We the people. Or how about um, the Statue of Liberty? So Lady Liberty has been standing tall and strong and proud in the shores of the northeast corner of our country since 1886, declaring, give us your poor and your huddled masses yearning to be free. Beautiful words. But do you know what's inscribed on the book that she's holding in her hands? That's the the beginning of our story. That's the root of who we are. It's actually inscribed there, the date. July 4th, 1776. Or how about the Canadian coat of arms? Or on the wall of the parliamentary building in Ottawa, Canada, its capital, Inscribed on both are words from the Lord. Psalm 72, 8. May he have dominion from sea to sea. But it's right here, people of God. This is it. This is our largest form of currency in the United States, and it's there, inscribed on it all. All of our, from the penny all the way to the $100 bill, right there, smack dab in the middle. You know what it says, in God we trust. God we trust has been on our money. It first appeared in 1861 on a coin at the dawn of the Civil War. Its message is very simple but very profound. We don't trust this. We do not trust this. We trust in God. 
This has been our single monetary motto for the last 161 years and is significant. We mustn't forget. So let me be clear. If I were president, trusting in God above all things, leaning not on my own understanding, would not just be lip service. That's number one. Number two is um, Romans 3.23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You've heard that before, right? This is an important, a significant distinction to make, not just in theology, but in governing a nation. All people are by nature sinful. Everyone. And if we get this wrong, if we build on the foundation that people are inherently good, everything that we build on it will crumble and fall. Everything. Every thought, every response, every action, every reaction, every expectation, every policy, therefore, everything will crash. Think about Jesus in his talk about the foolish man that builds a house on sand. It's going to fall. It's the wrong foundation. And so if you expect people to be civil and faithful and loyal and peaceable and loving, you're going to spend your life incredibly disappointed and you're going to be at a loss as to what to do next. And so when humanists who don't believe in God, I mean, that's in their credo, they don't believe in God, and even if they did, they certainly wouldn't trust in Him above all things. When humanists pass laws, they do so on this foundation that the individual, that the person is inherently good, but that institutions can be inherently or systemically evil. And so in cities and townships, for example, will vote to defund government policing in favor of community policing, they're doing so with this understanding that the individual is by nature good. And so when an individual violates the law within his profession, within his duty, then that alone would warrant the entire elimination of the whole institution. Are there rotten apples in the police department? Absolutely there are, but is this where evil ends? It can't. Are there rotten apples in fire departments? Law firms, hospitals? Are there rotten apples in pulpits and in churches across this country? Absolutely this is most certainly true. Why? Because everyone, every individual is by nature sinful and unclean. It's basic understanding of humanity. And so when townships, for example, believe that if you leave the good people of their community alone, they can successfully police themselves, how has that worked? Look at Minneapolis. Minneapolis tried that just last year. In 2021, in the city of Minneapolis, they had the highest rate of homicides in 26 years, second highest in their entire city's history. Their violent crimes went up 54%, and their property crimes went up 34% in just one year. This is basic understanding of humanity. Think about it this way. In 2006, there was this interesting study that was performed across the nation, across a uh, varying degrees of demographics. In order to test the study of perception, how and why people will feel safe. So they built playgrounds across the country without fences. And what they saw invariably was that children stayed at the center of the playground, not meandering too far beyond the actual playground equipment. And then after a number of months, they put fences up on the exterior of that property. And when they did so, they noticed an immediate change in the children's behavior. They began to roam. 
They began to explore with freedom all the way to the edge of that property, all the way to the fence. And here's what their researchers summarized, quote, the overwhelming conclusion was that within a given limitation, children felt safer to explore a playground with a boundary children felt at ease to explore. Fences brought freedom. It was the absence of boundaries that created fear and apprehension. That, my friends, is human nature, and that is Lutheran theology. This is what we've been teaching for 500 years. The threefold purpose of the law. Number one, it serves as a curb. This is how far you should go, and this is where you stop. We even say this in the prayer that we pray the most, the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses. What does it mean to trespass? It means going beyond the, the place where you're supposed to go. Well, let me be clear. If I were president, understanding humanity is paramount to governing a nation. But it's number three. It's from our epistle today, Galatians chapter 5. You were called to freedom. Only do not use your freedom for yourself, for the flesh. Serve one another in love. But, it says, if you bite and devour each other, watch out. I was raised to respect those in positions of authority. How I was raised. I've spent my life trying to be, have that godly respect for those that are placed in positions of authority. I often strenuously object to presidents and policies and practices, and, but I try to respect. I won't pretend to be an expert in political science, but I do have a question, and that question is simply this. What happened? When did we stop showing each other respect? Not just you and I, an average American, but the politicians themselves. When did they give up their respect for their, the sacred responsibility of we the people? When did they stop respecting the person on the other side, those who thought differently than they did? And this is what we see. If I were president, I would, I would stop the whining and the backbiting and the blaming and the hating. Because that stuff is rubbing off on the average American like us. God help us when we can't stop hating the person that thinks or lives differently than we do. When there is real, tangible, dangerous, destructive hatred that seems to be rubbing off on everybody, God help us. You know, in Galatians 5, the, the freedom that Paul is talking about is certainly a spiritual freedom. It was won for us by the, the gift of Jesus, dying on a cross, rising from the dead. That gift is yours. Nobody can take that away from you. That's justification. But knowing that, how then shall we live? Knowing that, at this time, in this place, in this nation, they're in the middle of it all. 24 karat biblical gold serve one another in love and stop biting and devouring one another. If we truly want God to bless America, this would be a great place to start. Amen. And now may the peace of God which is beyond our understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.